Good morning and welcome to Lighthouse. Thank you for joining our live stream. We hope that your family feels rested and rejuvenated as we enter into this time of worship. The only solid ground The nations rise and fall Kingdoms once strong now shaken We trust forever in your name The name of Jesus We trust the name of Jesus you will reign and every knee will bow we bring our expectations our hope is anchored in your name the name of Jesus oh we trust we trust the name of Jesus
holy Lord God. Father God, we just want to lift your name this, this morning, Lord God. We want to give you praise, honor, and glory, Lord God. For you are great. We serve a living God. We serve a, a God who gives us hope. Gives us a promise, Lord God. give you praise, Lord God. Father, we realize, Lord God, that you're the one that gives us hope. And Lord God, during times that are just so difficult, Lord God, you're the one that gives us the promise, the security, Lord God, that you're with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God.
grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard
Good morning, Lighthouse. Let me begin by saying thank you for inviting us into your home. We consider it an honor and a privilege to worship and share the word with you today. If you're blessed by this message, I, I hope that you'll take a moment and like it and share it with your friends. In fact, why don't you go ahead and do that right now because you're expecting God to speak to your heart and minister to you today. I, I want to take a moment and encourage you to stay in contact with our staff and church family. I've asked members of our church staff and the care ministry to reach out to you on a regular basis to check and see how you're doing and how your family is, to pray with you, to keep you updated concerning what's happening with the church. And uh, I would encourage you to make a few phone calls yourself to connect with one another. Uh, I've also ask our care ministry to let me know the prayer requests that you have and the concerns that you have so that we can better pray and care for you during this time. Each Sunday and Wednesday, uh, you will see a time of worship and the Word posted on Facebook and YouTube. So I hope that you'll take the time to, to stay with us there. Well, if you take your Bibles now, and turn with me to the book, the book of Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And it says this. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Well, today is a day that churches traditionally celebrate Palm Sunday. If you've attended church for very long, you've heard many Palm Sunday messages. They typically speak about the different aspects of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You've probably heard messages about the shouts of Hosanna, which literally means save. You've heard messages about the palm branches being waved and dropped, uh, which express the joyful, triumphant feelings. Palms were often dropped before a warrior returning from victory or before a king entering into the kingdom. You've heard messages about the rocks crying out. And chances are you've even heard messages 
about the donkey. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, he was fulfilling prophecy and presenting himself as the king of the Jews. Zechariah chapter 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, how many in the crowd understood the significance of what they witnessed? We can't be sure. However, we know that they responded by quoting their praises from the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 118. It says, O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Not only did Jesus fulfill prophecy as he entered Jerusalem, but he also forced the Jewish leaders to act. They had hoped to arrest him after the Passover, but because they were afraid of the people's response. But God had ordained that his son would be slain on Passover. He was going to be slain as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Every previous attempt to arrest Jesus had failed. And according to scripture, his hour had not yet come. When they saw this great public celebration, the religious leaders knew that they had to do something. They had to act. Commentators suggest that there were three special groups in the Passover crowd. The first group was the native Judeans who were suspicious of Jesus. The second group was the Galileans who followed him. And finally, the visitors from outside of Judea who didn't know hardly anything at all about Jesus. Within the crowds from Judea were people who saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Many of you perhaps have heard the statement that the crowd that cried Hosanna on Palm Sunday ended up crucifying him on, on Good Friday. Well, that's not true. You see, it was primarily the Jerusalem Jews, influenced by the priest, who asked for Jesus' blood. As Jesus advanced down the west side of the Mount of Olives toward the city and was praised by the crowds as their Messiah, the act of spreading their cloaks on the road in front of Jesus was a sign of respect. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God for all the miracles they had seen. The Pharisees understood the meaning of what was going on, for they told Jesus to rebuke his followers so that they would stop calling him Messiah or King. Jesus responded that there must be some proclamation that he is the Messiah. If not, even the rocks would call out in testimony of who he was. You see, all history had pointed towards this single spectacular event when the Messiah publicly presented himself to the nation. And God desired that this fact would be acknowledged. No doubt many of the Passover pilgrims thought that Jesus would now get rid of the Roman invaders and establish the glorious kingdom. You know, sometimes we have our way that we think God is going to work. Okay, Jesus, now's the time to set up your political kingdom, to overthrow the Roman occupiers, and we'll live happily ever, ever after. But that's not always the case. As we pick up back in Scripture at verse 41, it says this, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. The day will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus looked over the city and he began to weep. 
I don't think Jesus just cried. He wept. I believe that these, this was a deep, gut-wrenching sob of sorrow and love. Jesus wept over the city because the people did not understand the significance of what was going on that day. That national acceptance of him on that day would bring them peace. Because the people did not recognize the time of God's coming to them, the city would be destroyed by Roman soldiers starting in AD 70. Jesus said, if you only knew what would bring you peace, but you can't see it. It's hidden from you. Destruction is coming. It's on the way because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Today, can I ask you to take a moment and consider this question? If Jesus wept when he saw Jerusalem, I wonder what Jesus does whenever he looks over the nations of the earth today, when he looks over Europe and Asia and North America, when he looks over governments and regimes that imprison, torture, and kill those who simply choose to follow him. When he looks over our nation that was established as one nation under God, and he sees our cities, he sees our churches, he sees the states of our homes and of individual lives, and he finds that many people are either outright rejecting him or living in an indifferent, backslidden state. Would you consider what does Jesus think about the violence in our streets? What does he think about murder and domestic abuse? What does he think about the rebellious disregard for authority and the lawlessness of our society? What does he think about the failure to take personal responsibility, the self-centeredness, the greed, the fraud, the corruption of many in positions of authority? What does Jesus think about the flaunting of perversion, of sexual immorality? What does Jesus think about the epidemic of pornography, the sexual exploitation of, and abuse of children? What does he think of leaders, politicians, and so-called churches and clergy that call good evil and evil good? What does he think about celebrities and politicians celebrating the killing of innocent babies while they're still in their mother's womb? You know, people can chant and rant about their individual's right to choice. Friend, I want you to hear me very loud and clear. You do have a choice. You have a choice of the actions that you take. But you do not get a choice when it comes to the consequences. The Bible says that God is a God of judgment. Because he is holy and cannot tolerate sin, there must be some way to judge wrongdoing. His holiness demands justice for sins that are committed. It was our sin that separated us from the holiness of God. God's word says in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. Your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue matters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. Is it possible that what we see taking place right now in America and around the world is a gentle shaking I want to say that again. Is it possible that what we see taking place right now in, in America and all around the world is a gentle shaking 
an attempt of a loving God to awaken the church and awaken mankind to the nearness of his visitation. Jesus said in Matthew 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. You see, God is a God of judgment. I know that many people speak about the grace of God, and God is a gracious and compassionate God, but His holiness demands that sin must be atoned for. God dealt viciously with sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says that God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus paid the price for your sin and mine upon the cross. He suffered. He bled. He died. Yet in spite of that, there are those who refuse to acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord. They'll continue to reject His offer of mercy and forgiveness, and they will live their lives in opposition to Him. They will reject the very thing that would bring them peace. And instead, they will choose destruction. For those people, Jesus weeps. And and so should we. He weeps over their stubbornness. He weeps over their hard-heartedness. He weeps over mankind's spiritual blindness. If you're listening to me today, and you're concerned about your relationship with Jesus, I want to encourage you to, at this even very, this very moment, that you'd surrender your life to Him. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He will pay the price. He's already done it, but you have to accept His gift of salvation. He will pay the price and the penalty for your sin. And He'll give you peace and He'll give you confidence. In the midst of all that's going on right now, You and I can have an assurance, we can have a boldness, we can have a confidence that only comes from being in relationship with Him. I'm going to say this to you as well. If you're living a sinful lifestyle, I'm asking you to to think about what's happening around about you. I'm asking you to take a few moments and, and as God begins to shake those things that can be shaken, As God begins to to, to move in our community and as He begins to move across the earth, that you'll use this as a warning time. That you'll consider that perhaps God is trying to speak to you and He's trying to draw you. I pray that your heart will not be hardened. I pray that you'll not be spiritually deaf or spiritually blind and, and think that you can live a life of sin and rebellion against God and doing your own thing and being and being the God of your own life, following other things and allowing things to be set up in your life as idols, and think that God's going to be okay with that. For those who would like, I'd just like to take a minute and pray with you. If you're unsure of what's happening, if you're anxious, if you're fearful, the Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. And so today I want to pray. And I'd ask it that you would that you would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and that you would pray with me. That you would just ask the Lord, Father, would you speak to my heart? So I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you care about your people. I thank you that even this moment, as you look upon our cities, as you look upon our communities, as you look upon the brokenness of our society. And many people have no regard for you. They've chosen to reject you. They've chosen to turn their back on you. They've chosen to mock you. And yet you still love them. And yet you still call after them. I pray, Father, that the blinders that are on people's eyes, even as they hear this message, that the blinders would fall off of them. That the the scales would fall off of their eyes. And they would see their true need and they'd see where they stand with you. 
I pray for those who cannot hear. I pray that you would open their ears so that they can hear the voice of God. They can find forgiveness and mercy and grace. Father, I pray that as they are given this opportunity, Lord, we choose to humble ourselves before you. We choose to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the way, he's the truth, and the life. That no man comes to the Father but by him. And so today, Lord, we accept your sacrifice upon Calvary as being the payment for our sins. We put our faith and our trust in you, and we receive eternal life through Jesus Christ. We confess you as Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. Now, for those of you who respond to Jesus, there's going to be another Palm Sunday. I know that there's people who are disappointed because they didn't go to get to go, won't have the church, the, the opportunity to go to church on Palm Sunday. There's going to be another Palm Sunday. In Revelation chapter 7, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. I'm so glad that you and I have an assurance that because we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, that we have an assurance of victory. We have an assurance that we're going to see him once again. We have an assurance that no matter what goes on around about us with our retirement accounts or what goes on with our jobs, that the Lord is looking out for us and we have an eternal promise of being with him forever. Thank you for the privilege to be in your home. We're looking forward to seeing you again uh, this coming Wednesday night. So God bless you. We love you. And we pray that you have a great day in the Lord. Thanks for joining us online today. We miss being able to see each other face to face, but we're still here to serve you. Our food pantry is still in operation with some slight modifications and the church staff is still available and ready during the week to receive prayer requests and answer your questions. We hope you've been enjoying our weekly devotionals we've been posting to Facebook. Keep checking our Facebook pages for some more updates. And if you'd like to be added to our email list to receive updates, you can contact Nancy in the church office. We'll see you next week in online church, and we hope to connect with you soon.